Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann. I would like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. I know there are a ton of great podcasts out there and the fact that you choose mine, I appreciate. I have a conversation today that ties into rabbit woman and dog man. But before we get to that, I'm going to catch you up with this piece right here as a minimalist is one of my most cherished possessions. And today I'm going to break down to you how this all started and and the how, what, when, and why, and catch you up because yes, I've got guests. Here we are. It is, uh, we are in preseason football. The Hall of Fame game was last week, was a little bit off, but we have preseason football here. It is that time of the year. And it's been weird because in New York, as you can see, it's kind of gray today. We've had maybe five days of blue skies, and that's from the fires in Canada, that smoke coming down. When I was in Greece, it was at its worst point. I wasn't here, but I remember reading an article where we were told, oh, that smoke's going to be there all summer. I'm like, no way is this smoke going to be in New York all summer. It is. And it's crazy because you don't know what time it is in the morning. You don't know what it's going to be like out, but when it is nice, it's wild. And we had a sunny day on Saturday. Could not believe it happened on a weekend. There couldn't be more exciting news for all of us as in my building, everybody's waking up, texting, you're going to be at the pool, right? You're going to, of course. I mean, we'd get sunlight. I would sneak up there during the week if we had some pretty weather. And there had been a day or two where it was beautiful, uh, but I had meetings and couldn't reschedule them. But at this point, with the limited sunshine that we've been getting, if there's the next sunny day and I'm able to clear the deck, you better believe I'll be doing it. Now, I can't do it for fantasy football drafts, but most of them are at night in the evening since other people are working during the day, so I don't have to worry about that. But had an awesome day at the pool on Saturday, followed by getting out with some friends. Jocelyn Jane is in town again, so we got to go out, took her to Civilian, really nice rooftop lounge, and I was just out, and it was funny. My friend and I are sitting at dinner at Sicily, which is one of my favorite little new restaurants I discovered last year in Hell's Kitchen. Beautiful Italian food, great service. And we're sitting there and we hear this giggling coming down the street. And as I look up, there's like 12 girls, beautiful young girls all walking together, high heels, short skirts, little tank tops, little bralettes. And I looked at my friend Christian. I said, oh, remember those days. And here I am in my floor-length sundress, just being my most fabulous 51-year-old self. And we laughed so hard. It was like my past walked right by me as I was sitting down enjoying a fairly early 8 p.m. dinner. You know, I don't like to eat crazy late. Uh, But we just giggled about it, and it was just fun. It's fun to be out when it's nice and see everybody in the city having a great time, celebrating the weather. And so this kind of gloom that we've had this summer has really, really, really put an exclamation point on nice weather. When it's nice, I feel like everybody leaves their apartment. The streets are packed and not in an annoying way, in a way where you're like, oh, it's so exciting to see everybody out. And we're all celebrating the same thing. We're celebrating the fact that the weather is so spectacular. There's no way we're going to stay in our apartments. And I think that this kind of cloud covering, this smoke that we've had this summer has been the next level of appreciating when the weather is nice. And we've all been celebrating it. And so that was my all day Saturday was just enjoying, enjoying, enjoying working the tan a little bit more, working the tan and getting ready for Sunday, which was going to be the day where I started to really analyze my draft schedule, what leagues I've got to move over to Fantrax, my two personal leagues that I commission, I'm moving from Yahoo to Fantrax, the new league that I set up on Fantrax. So a lot of checking in when you're the commish. You got to make sure everybody's signed up and has no problems logging in. You've got to confirm that the draft date is good with everybody. I've got other leagues that I'm not the commissioner in, but I'm in. So I'm starting to get those emails. So I took all day Sunday and I planned it Sunday because NFL Network released the top 100 players. And it's one of my favorite, favorite things. And 
so you know, the voice of the NFL top 100 players is Dan Soder. I know Dan through he and Jay Okerson's show for many years on Sirius XM Comedy Central. Um, Dan Soder's a comedian who you probably may have seen, or if you're not following him, you should. He also is Mephi on Billions, which happened later. But he's a diehard San Fran fan. And I remember the very first year he was the narrator, I lost my shit because, you know, when you hear one of your friend's voice, you know it's your friend's voice. And, you know, they don't show the credits to later. And I remember texting him at that time years ago, be like, bro, how did you get this gig? He's like, it is my favorite gig all year. I love doing it. And so not only do I love the little tidbits, like the fact that there's been 377 pairs of siblings in the NFL. All these little tidbits that you get during the NFL top 100. But if you're a fantasy football player, or if you are someone that loves the NFL, I will rewatch this same thing while I'm in my office for about a week straight. Sounds obsessive, but you know, you catch some things one time you listen, you catch other things the next time you listen. And, and it's in my friend's voice, which I absolutely love because you know when your friend gets a gig that they love, you're so happy because you're like, oh, he's loving this gig and I love listening to him do it. But you learn little things about players, whether it's uh, something with their family, maybe their their father or their mother was an athlete of some, you learn things and then they also add in sound and, and plays from different games through the season and maybe some smack talk. And it is just so enjoyable and it is my first layer. Even though I've already started, of course, I never stopped listening to fantasy sports news, but even though I've started to really pick up the pace because the football diehards is on more days a week than it is during the off season. You know, I listen to NFL live on podcasts every day. I'm back listening to the fantasy footballers every episode and watching them on YouTube. So that starts to pick up. But for some reason, the seal is officially broken when I get to hear Dan Soder's voice giving me the NFL top 100 players. You get the stats, you get all the goodness, you get a little backstory, you get all that. Now, if you all remember a couple of years ago, we had a show called Ballers on HBO with The Rock, which was another layer. It would be NFL's top 100, then it would be Ballers, and then Hard Knocks would come out. And I'm like, okay, the season is here. This is really happening. Now we don't have Ballers, but we have the Hard Knocks, which will be the New York Jets this year, which of course they wanted to stick a camera in Aaron Rodgers' face because they knew he wouldn't be loving that. But whatever, it's going to be great. We always love it. We love to hear the sounds of the game. Quarterback was an incredible, credible, credible series put together on Netflix. Of course, the Manning brothers, they never fail. Okay, they're just amazing. But so there's all these things that have gotten me to this point where I'm like, all right, you know, I'm not missing summer because it's been looking like this. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to lean into football because the weather's still so nice. You're like, oh, it's preseason. It's August. The weather's so great. I don't want to be sitting inside watching the games. I'm like, oh, we got games I'm watching. And this weekend, this coming weekend, I will be going to Canton, Ohio for the Fantasy Expo, my first time going. I'm really excited. I'm going to meet a lot of people that I've had a lot of great conversations with on social media, people that I'm already in leagues with that I've never met in person. Just so many great people, and that's going to be it. I won't need ballers. I won't need hard knock. Me and Kay at the expo, chilling with all of our fantasy people. I'm in the Queen's Classic, which is a draft that's going to take place on Saturday. There's a flag football tournament. Des Bryant has a team. Yes, Dallas Cowboys, Des Bryant. So Des Bryant will be in the fold as well. But it's just that time of the year where you start to reconnect with people that you lose track of over the summer. But because it's fantasy football season, you get super close. And I'm so excited about it. I will be back on air now. Bet Better Sports Network rebranded. Fantasy Alarm, my co-host, Howard Bender. I listen to Howard Bender every single day on Fantasy Sports Radio. Uh, he's another one of my favorite people that I've gotten to meet through this space and the fact that we are going to co-host a show together. Howard Bender has such a comedic sense. He wants to put these, these things together that when I listen as a fan, you build your own imagination with all of the different things. There's a segment they have. And their producer, Shannon Blunt, is like, 
amazing. It's called The Wheel of Randomness. And Shannon explains it, even though I, in my mind, I know truly Shannon is in a studio in a completely different state. Howard's in California. His co-host, Jim, is in Florida. But yet you are actually picturing what this wheel would look like because Shannon talks about, oh, I put some glitter on it today. Here are some different categories. And, and Howard is just really a creator, uh, you know, a, like, a, like a Broadway show creator, but on the radio. And I can remember doing shows with Howard and really starting to lean in and understand what this could be like for the listener, for the viewer. And now I'm going to get to do that every Wednesday night starting next week, back on air for the football season, working with Howard Bender, dreams coming true, super excited. So it's going to be a really fun season. Howard is a dog lover. I got to have dinner, lunch with him and his wife at Bryant Park when they came through the city last year. Uh, just exciting stuff. And this is when I have to be very mindful to not only talk football because I know not everybody is into it. Um, so I get that. So I, this, the podcast I will make sure is less sports than, than normal because I know I will talk a lot of football, but you know, it's just a passion of mine. It's a great escape. I lean in hard. I will be doing fantasy football Fridays. I putting my schedule together. They will kick off on Friday, September 1st, because the weekend before I'm in Vegas hosting the fantasy football draft event at Sapphire pool. And this weekend I'll be in Canton. So normally I start fantasy football Fridays in August and I preview, but this year I decided I really wanted to go to Canton. I really want to be a part of this fantasy football. All it's called the ultimate fantasy football draft weekend. And they turn every cabana in at the pool area into a draft center, which is insane. So I can't wait to see what this looks like and everybody out there. And then I will be on lockdown and I'll be ready to be making some betting picks, to be doing DFS challenges with everyone out there. And whether you're into it and you want to play in a season long league or whether you want to do a daily fantasy challenge, I put those out. They're free challenges. It's just a fun way to follow individual players and really follow their stat lines. And sports are just, you know, it's a great neutralizer. I heard a great ad the other day and it was for fantasy football. And it said, are you looking to make more friends? Are you looking to get closer to your other friends? Are you looking to have a lot of conversation when you meet new friends? And it all went down to fantasy football. I couldn't have agreed with it more. The conversation is about to go right here. And this is rabbit woman and dog man. The history will be told in this conversation. But one of the things I want to point out is when I started shooting photos in the city with Allie, Allie and I found so many unique things because we would just, during the pandemic, Allie and I would go out, there's nobody out. We would just walk in a different direction each time and find these different unique things to take pictures with. And I always told Allie, like, I will never post a photo right away from a statue or piece of art, an exhibit of any sort, because I have to go home and look it up and address it properly. I want to know why it's there. Who commissioned it? Is it raising money for a cause? Is there an artist that I want to tag? Has this been in other countries that I want to look up the hashtags that people have used to properly tie in to the art? So my first experience with rabbit woman and, and rabbit woman and dog man was right outside the Sirius XM studios, um, right by rock center. There's the rabbit woman, dog man, paparazzi, and they're in this beautiful breezeway that's between two buildings that if you're walking too fast, you're never going to see it. But if you're like me and you like to cut through buildings, which I always do in the city, there's all these cool walkways and there's often a lot of cool art in these walkways. And they're, they're just like just little cutouts in between the buildings. There's no driving. It's just a sidewalk width. And it just so happens this one that's by Sirius XM, I thought, oh my gosh, paparazzi, this makes so much sense because years ago there were always paparazzi outside of Sirius because we knew, you know, celebrities were going in there to do PR tours for movies, um, all of those things. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was alone. I took selfies with it and there's this beautiful waterfall and it actually is gated at night. They lock it up so nobody can mess with it. It's gated at night. 
there were times during the pandemic where it was gated, it wasn't open. And so this was my first experience. And then as I started to walk by more often, I realized like, I really need to look this up. I love this so much. I need to look up who, what, why, and where rabbit woman and dogman. So I find Jillian Mark. And when I find Jillian Mark, I look through their social media. I go to JillianMark.com and I'm like, this is fascinating. This isn't just an art installation. This has an incredible purpose to raise awareness. And this, this, the rabbit woman dog man, the purpose is, of course, you'll learn in the conversation, but a representation of them as a couple, how different they are, but how truly connected they are. And that's fascinating. Then during the pandemic, we go down to Hudson Yards because I, I see that there's another piece. So you can look on their social media to find out if you are traveling somewhere and you want to go and take some amazing pictures and also learn about the different exhibits that pop up throughout the world that are raising awareness and money for the causes of helping animals fight extinction. They're considered eco-warriors, Jillian Mark. And I cannot introduce, wait to introduce them to you, but they sent me this as a thank you after I spotted one of their pieces without a plaque this year in Las Vegas at Resorts World. And now I have one of my own. And the best part about having this right here is I might have one of my own, but I have two new friendships and you're going to enjoy them as much as I do. As I sit here with one of my most prized possessions, my friends that I've met through the power of the internet and celebrating their work, I've got Jillian Mark here and you can follow everything. I'll make sure you have all of the social media as well as website, but it's such a pleasure to be with you two today. I'm so glad we have connected across the globe. Oh, we're so happy to be here with you, Lisa Ann, and we feel exactly the same way, don't we, Mark, that we've been able to meet you online. It's so wonderful what online gives us nowadays, and we're so happy to share our story with you today. Yeah, and the story of meeting you has been incredible because all of a sudden, I think it was about three years ago, you popped up on our feed, and uh, <laughs> I'm saying to Julie, is this an amazing looking woman? And she's got like millions of followers, <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's with our sculpture. Like, how good is this? Exactly. And right. it, so it started when uh, you're, you're, you're rabbit and dog woman uh, outside of the Sirius XM studios in Manhattan, which are stationary. And it started with me taking pictures of those two. Like every time I would go over to the Sirius, I would, you know, take a selfie with them. Then I realized like, I need to discover this art and find out where this came from. The plaque is there. I take a picture of it. I go home, I Google you. And then it becomes this almost like, where's Waldo? I'm finding <laughs> pieces in different places and I'm incredibly excited. But let's start there. How did you get those two to be stationed in that gorgeous hallway in between buildings that most people don't know about, but they get to stare at this beautiful yeah, waterfall? Awesome. That setting is incredible. How did you two get those two there? And um, how are they stationary? Oh, Arlen? the Rockefeller. The Rockefeller. What's it? Yes. 75 Rockefeller. Yeah, yeah 75 Rockefeller. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, Sixth Avenue, um, they wanted to bring some uh, hope and the idea of equality into New York. So they reached out to us and commissioned us to do an artwork that would sort of celebrate diversity. And this is like five years ago, six I, years ago? Yeah, I think it is. It's quite a long time ago. So we came up with the idea of um, dog man and rabbit woman holding cameras because everybody wants their 60 seconds of fame. So we thought if we put these wonderful characters that everybody loves into an amazing prominent position, everybody's gonna go, up to them and take their photo with them. And that's exactly what happened. And then we also put the four paparazzi dogs into the Rockefeller, into those Rockefeller offices as well. So every day people share photos of themselves. And I know you did as well, Lisa Ann, and we love that photo of themselves with Dogman and Rabbit Woman and the four paparazzi dogs. And they do the most crazy things. We have like the most amazing collection of everyone taking their photos with, with yeah. our characters. Hello, the, the idea um, with Rabbit Woman and Dog Man is that uh, a rabbit in the wild would be eaten by a dog. And so enemies. But in our sort of new creation of the world, a world that's more loving, we've got a dog and rabbit that are lovers and soulmates. 
and it becomes like a wonderful metaphor for how we would like um, all humans to behave, is to accept our differences, embrace them, and actually um, let's just all love in with each other. And that's the idea, I guess, of Robert, Robert Woman and Dog Man's um, togetherness, isn't yes. it? Yes. And actually, Lisa Ann, it's autobiographical. So I'm the rabbit and Mark's the dog. And we are also quite an unlikely couple because I'm Catholic and I come from England and Mark's Australian and he's Jewish. And amazingly, we met in Hong Kong. We fell in love very, very quickly and we were married seven. Well, we eloped. We were very naughty at the time. And we were both <laughs> engaged to different people. <laughs> and we eloped and we got married in Pokhara, which is actually at the full foothill of the Himalayas. So that's kind of when the story began. And when we met each other, we realized that all of our values were aligned and it was literally love at first sight. And we both wanted to create art together. So from the day we met, we were creating art together. And then when we created Rabbit Woman and Dog Man, we realized that they were actually us. Us. Yeah. yeah. I knew they were you two. I figured this out not too long ago <laughs> because of course, after going to your site and reading about how different your stories were, and it's, it's a great narrative because it reminds people that if you feel a connection with somebody and that vibration is high, you can't discount that just because you come from different backgrounds. You have things that are maybe opposites, opposites do attract, but you mentioned your values were aligned. Uh, they, they, they really are, aren't they, Mark? So we, 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 we realized that very early on that everything that we like to do or everything that I like to do, Mark liked to do as well. So it made it very easy, to be honest, because we're with each other 24 hours a day, yeah, aren't we? Yeah. I think, I think it's such a great word that you just touched on is values. Um, and I know it's so important now that when you are looking at um, like-minded people, that you do really look at values because values is what pushes you um, towards uh, the light. And, and that's how we feel about each other, that once you've got shared values, the rest of the differences don't matter because you're all walking in the same place. And as, as you sort of mentioned, towards the light and hope. So you meet, you elope, you're married. Did you know that you would be this successful creating art together? It, no, of course not. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a very long kind of uh, messy journey. Like it's been a wonderful journey, but it hasn't been planned or really thought out because Mark and I are personalities are that we go with the flow so it's been quite organic what's happened over the years and it has taken a long time to get to this point but it's been like a wonderful journey and we've both been walking down the same road together which is so lovely um all these years because it's been 32 years yeah, right. now yeah, 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 that we've been yes. doing this i think i think also um to be honest it never really occurred to us to be successful or, or not successful. We just love making art and love being creative. And so I think if you really are passionate about something and you know, we, we kind of do it 24 hours a day, uh, it's never worked for us. It's just really, really enjoyment. Then good things happen because you're putting so much time and energy and, and, and truth into what you do. So that's the message. If you really love something, if you're really passionate about something, you spend a lot of time doing it and then good things happen. And, and that is so true. I have questions about how difficult it is to get this art. So you're based in Australia. You have a gallery in Sydney. How much work is it to get some of these larger pieces? Let's start with right now. You have an incredible piece that I'm going to visit next week at the World Trade Center. That's a massive piece. How difficult is it logistically? How much do you worry about it when it's on its way over here? And do you have a point of contact that lets you know that everything is perfect when everything <laughs> arrives? It's taken a long time for us to perfect transporting massive sculptures, hasn't it, Mark? Yeah, it has. So it's like, um, it's a really good question. It's kind of yeah. technical as well. So shipping um, comes in containers. So there's a 40-foot yeah. container and a 20-foot container. Um, containers are only two... Uh, I'll talk in metrics, uh, are only 2.1 meters wide. Yes. I don't know what that is in, in feet. No. So nothing can be wider than that. Um, the interesting thing is, though, there's things called open tops with containers. So although the width is only 2.1 meters, the, the height is infinite. So you can have things as tall as you want 
because it's an open top. So it sits there on the, the ship and, you know, just the sky above you. But your width is restricted. So you have to piece, if you're making something that is really wide, really, really wide and goes beyond that 2.1 width, you have to slice the sculptures. Well, this does sound very crude, but slice the sculpture into different pieces so then they would get pieced together on sites just so that it can fit in containers. Yeah. And that, that engineering can be challenging. But the, the thing is interesting for, for your listeners is that um, New York is a very litigious place. As you can imagine, there's so much sort of going on. And so there's a lot of restrictions on um, how things are vetted. Uh, a New York engineer has to look working for the city has to look at every single piece to make sure that it's not going to kill anyone and the sure. steel's in the right places. Liability. Mm -hmm. Liability. Big, oh, big thing in America. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Second thing is in terms of, you can imagine the World Trade Center, you've got security there. Yeah. And then you've also got the logistics of when you can, um, when you can offload and roads and traffic police and all that. Yeah. So it's a big operation. It is. And, and, and not only that, Lisa Ann, but we, uh, Mark and I believe that our, our that public art should be interacted with. So we allow people to, if we make seats on our sculpture for people to get on and we make benches with extra spots for people to sit on. And we like people to interact with our sculptures, especially the animal sculptures, because we love doing endangered animals. And we believe via David Attenborough, who's our hero, that you need to connect with something in order to form it a bond with it in order to care about it and love it and want to protect it you need to form that connection and the only way to form that connection is to have that um moment where you can actually touch an animal get up close to it feel it ride it whatever you need to do so again making all our sculptures interactive is so important and that's that's another that's another logistic logistical yes. you know yeah thing that we have to think about yeah. And make it, and so to your point with liability, yeah. to make it safe so yeah. no one can get hurt. <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure they would much rather, many cities in the U.S. would rather have it kind of fenced off so that if yes. somebody does climb over the fence and hurt themselves, they're not liable. It's all about liability here. Yes. Yes. But you had a massive, massive, uh, was it Nigami uh, that was down at Hudson Yards where yes. I got, yes. oh, I got to sit yes, in his hand. And that, was, and that was during the pandemic. So it was very hard to get out, but it was neat that people were still down there. Yeah. And it was the one time everyone yeah. would sneak their mask off because they wanted to sit yeah. in the hand. Yes. And it was just beautiful to see if to just sit and watch. I'm sure you, you've you seen this, but just to watch how people walk up and adore oh, it, oh. then figure out how they're to take their photos yeah. then they're realizing like there's no sign here i think i can sit in the hand you know oh, and it, it was nice. that was a massive structure that's one of them where i stood there and thought how many pieces did that have to be moved in because it was so large yes yes, yes. it was a lot that was, was a, lot. a lot and how did you feel when you did sit in his hand did that make you feel more connected for sure. I mean, all the way down to the details that you both put into the hands. You know, of course, it reminds us of what was the movie where uh, he picked up the woman? It was an yes. old yes. movie. King, King Kong. Kong. Yeah, 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 yeah. King Kong. Right, right, right. It reminded me of that. But you get up to the detail and you're awestruck over, wow, this is what it must feel like. This is oh. the indentions, this big hand. It was just so beautiful. Oh, that's nice. And I, I loved it. You raise money through awareness by us connecting with your beautiful pieces for all the different animals out there. How did you two start this part of your project? Well, so, so Julie was brought, um, was brought up in Africa. And so from a very, very young age, well, you tell the story. Yeah, so I, I spent my childhood in, in Africa. So from a very young age, I was surrounded by wildlife. So it just became like part of my DNA. And I think when I was around nine or 10 years old, I went on safari with my mom and my little brother, and I witnessed the shooting of a, an elephant, a mother elephant. And it was like horrific. We, we, we saw the elephant being shot. And then my brother, who was much younger than me and I, we went and stood by the dead elephant. And then later we were told by the party that we were with that the elephant was also pregnant. And so from that day forward, I decided that I was going to do everything in my power to protect elephants. I was just so in love with elephants and that, that never left me. So when I met Mark, he also had spent a huge amount of time in Africa as well. And we had similar. Yeah. When I was young, I, I went to, um, mm. to Gombe stream with, um, Jane Goodall to study chimpanzees. 
And so from a very, very young age, both of us had a, um, a first-hand connection with animals. That, that was very life-changing. And so you ask, you know, why we're doing this and raising the money is because we made a promise when we were young children, that we would do everything we can to protect and support and love wildlife. And we've kept, we've been kept true to that. And so um, we spend uh, maybe one or two months uh, a year uh, with wildlife. In Africa. Yeah, studying them, mm. drawing them. So we've seen most of most wildlife that we've seen in the world. So time spent in, in all of Asia and India and Africa and North America and looking at the most endangered species and taking photographs of them and studying them. And so going back to Nyani, we spent a long time in Uganda with the with the gorillas, <coughs> studying their hands and looking at them to making sure that we really can bring to, to New York. People aren't going to be able to go to Uganda, but we could. So we bring the essence of it and try to um, bring that into the, you know, the urban environment so people can be touched by wildlife. It's just spectacular, uh, the detail, the, the moments, and now I've realized from following you how many different places and how many different incredible designs you have. What's the process from deciding what you're creating when it comes to, we know your original rabbit woman and dog man, right. what's the process when you say, okay, this is the movement that we want to be focused on for this year, contacting the different countries and cities and places and what you're going to create? Well, we always, we definitely get influenced and we definitely get emotional about when we travel, we get inspired. So when we, for instance, go to Africa, we try to go to Africa every year if we can or every other year if we can. And we try to go and see animals that are endangered or their lives are threatened. And when we see those animals, at that point, we become inspired. So it's the actual traveling and seeing the animals, very similar to like people getting inspired when they're seeing the sculptures. We get inspired when we see the animals in the wild. And after that, we will, both of us come up with ideas. So we'll brainstorm together, won't we, Mark? And we'll come up with a plan of what we're going to do for the year, what, um, exhibitions we're going to do and we try and do like a, a few big exhibitions and we align ourselves with amazing charities like WWF or Sheldrick Wildlife Trust or um, depending on the animal that we're studying we'll align ourselves with them and then we'll come up with an amazing idea we try and come up with an amazing idea that is interactive to the public we try and make it interactive rather than yeah. static. I think but I think one of the things we do is um, creatively we start with the with the problem and the problem for us, as you just sort of mentioned, would be um, there's too many rhinos dying from, mm. from poaching, poaching yeah. each year. So that's the problem. And then we work back from that. Um, do people really know how many rhinos are being lost? Do they know why they're being lost? Do, know the, do they know the countries which are causing a lot of this damage? And so in the, um, in the charity work we do, we focus on how can we raise money to fix the problem? How can we create awareness around the stories so people are, uh, know what's going on? And hopefully then have a positive outcome, not just in terms of the money, which is very important, but also just in terms of changing hearts and minds. And um, then the, the sculpture will echo all of that, and that becomes a very holistic mm. um, project. Like, like a few years ago, Lisa and we went to, we, we heard that there was only one northern male rhino left on this planet. So a few years ago, uh, we went to visit him and um, we were so fortunate that we got to see him because at that point he was already very old. He was 45 years old and 45 wow. years old is literally the end of a, of a rhino's life. So we... He had, they were, he was under 24 hour guard being protected. So we were allowed to get up close to him and we were allowed to pat him and we were allowed to like tickle him and we were allowed to feed him carrots. And he was completely tamed because he was being looked after. And it was like the most amazing thing to be so close to a rhino. And then we built the last three northern yeah, just, just, on that, oh, okay. just on that, for us as well, we knew that there's one male northern white rhino left on the planet. And we knew that if we didn't get to Africa soon enough, we would never see the species again. So just spending, we spent a couple of days with him. It was so emotional because we we're very aware that this was the last of his kind. We were very aware that he was there without any other species um, that were, were, were with him. And what would that be like as a human being if you're the last human left on Earth? And so we kept on going over and over our heads. How could mankind reduce a species that were in their hundreds of thousands to just one 
and then the species disappear forever. So it was quite an emotional it was. undertaking for us. And, and, and weirdly as well is we felt that emotion from Sudan. That was his name. We kind of felt like he had that melancholy or sadness about him. And we spent two weeks with him. So we spent a lot of time with him. And then we also met um, the last two female northern white rhinos as well. So we met all three of them. We studied them. We sketched them. We photographed them. And then we decided to do a big sculpture that went into Astor Place. That was, I think it was in 2000, when was it, 2018? Yeah. And we did them all stacked on top of each other like they were the threesome. And it was, we called them the last three. And then a week after we installed the sculpture, Sudan died. So it was just so oh. bad, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. But you kept him alive and it's the educational factor too. Yes. What you hope is that, you know, let's say a family goes and takes photos of their children, then they're going to look up these animals, yes. learn more about them. Yeah. Where are they from? That's you know, what's their origin? And the levels of animals becoming extinct in countries that we are not as connected to can be just forgotten, right? Especially you're living in a big city. It's not something you think about. Absolutely. Very, very true. And that's that's exactly what we wanted to happen. We wanted to people to, a lot of people wrote to us afterwards, said that they didn't know anything about the Northern White Rhinos. They didn't know they were endangered they, and that we taught them so much. So that was that was nice to know that we had been able to spread that awareness. That's yes, so important. Yes, yes, yes. Look, just to follow up with your question again, um, to talk about, you, you asked about how do we come up with a project or an idea. Another very, very important project in New York that we did was Statues for Equality. And... Um, that was basically trying to, what was that trying to do? Well, we were trying to balance the gender gap between male and female sculptures. So when we went out and did our research, we noticed that only 3% of all statues were female and the rest were in male. In New York City. In, in New, New York, York City. City. Yeah, and the rest yeah, were male. Yeah. Yeah, we well, just, you know, I, I, if I go through what I know has been stationary here for a very long time, yeah. I mean, we got the greatest one ever in the Statue of Liberty. But, you know, that's that's, you know, that's a different story. But you're yeah. right. They are all male. We've got Christopher yes. Columbus. We've got male strat. Yes. Male statues. So we said, OK, well, this doesn't seem very, very balanced. This doesn't seem very fair. This doesn't feel very equal. So let's let's try and change that percentage overnight. So we uh, put out a poll and we ended up sculpting 10 amazing, inspiring women. And um, overnight, we changed that percentage from 3% to 10%. In New York in City? New, in New York City alone. So, that, and, that, and then after that, we, we, we've carried on. So we, we try always now to do as many female statues as we can and celebrate you know, female greatness as, as much as men's because that's very yeah. important. Look, and we're so honored. Um, we got to um, work with Ruth, the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and the Supreme Court, and um, oh, what an honor! Yeah, it was honor. It was honor. It was. It was an what honor. an honor for the two of you. I know. So we got to um, create her sculpture, and then it was literally three weeks before it was supposed yeah. to be unveiled. Yeah. Sadly, she she, died, she yeah. passed. Yeah. Um, but you know, what's fantastic, we still managed to unveil it and have that statue in her honor, um, and it was the only statue of her that was actually endorsed by her and you know, worked with her and. And that was just fantastic. It really was. It really was. The fact that you two are in Australia and everyone knows you around the world must be a powerful feeling. Do you think about that often? No. <laughs> Not really. No. no. <laughs> Not really. No. We just come to work. Well, we don't call it work. We just come to the gallery every day. And like Mark said before, we love what we do. Um, it doesn't feel like work. We're just here doing what we love. And, and honestly, it's, it's that simple. This past January, I stumbled on one of your pieces inside Resorts World in Las Vegas. Yes. Uh, and that hotel has a ton of beautiful art everywhere. But I walk in, it's right at the front door when you're entering the Hilton. And I said to my friends, oh, that's a Jillian Mark. Like, I know this. Let me show you other. And, and, and he was like, what? And then I, there was no plaque. So I went to the front desk and I asked the woman, why do you not have the plaque? It's very important. This is how they Thank raise you. awareness yeah. for animals. And this is this is for animal mm -hmm. sanctuaries and to raise money and this and that. And the girl was like, how do you know who they are? And I said, look, if you're going to go out and take pictures with things, the best thing you can do is stay curious. Take a picture of the plaque. Okay. When you get home, look it up and, and just lean in. It's just it's it's out there for you. It's not just for the, to stand yeah. by. And so... 
throughout the trip, you know, a bunch of my friends were coming in. They're like, that's the artist that you two love. Like, yes. And you're right at the door. It is the greatest entrance to stand by. And I just visit it every time I'm there. I'm like, okay, it's good. But I (laughs) noticed everything else in there was sectioned off. And I always wondered why yours wasn't. And now I know you want people to feel comfortable touching it and seeing it and getting the detail close up instead of being three feet away. Yes. Yes. That's such a great observation because we were in the gallery the other day and there was a painting on the wall. We got told off, didn't we? I've got to say, we weren't touching it, but we just got, we're just looking at it. And then immediately there were two security guards going, what are you doing? And we're like, well, you know, we're we're 12 inches away from it. That's too close. (laughs) It's just, it's just very sterile in in a gallery because if you do want to zoom in and just look at the technique and just go a bit closer and like really study it, they're straight away saying, oh, there's a line on the floor and they're saying, oh, no, you can't. It's way too close. You're breathing on it. Whatever. <laughs> That's how it is at MoMA. There's quite a few yeah. things where there's just a line of tape on the floor. Yeah, yeah, so you're just like, you're. it's an invisible like force <laughs> field, but you're right. You can't lean up on it. I'm not no, going to touch it. I respect art. We're not going to do any of that. Yeah. So you have your exhibit right now that's at World Trade yeah. Center and you did just find out that it's going to is it going to stay here or is it going to go somewhere else and come back it's going to stay for one year at the world trade center which we're so thrilled about i mean honestly lisa and we couldn't have a better location to spread awareness to these amazing animals and we feel so grateful that we have that location and again every day people send us photos and you know, tag love the last, and it makes us very, very, very happy to see that, doesn't it, Mark? Yes, mm. but but the exciting news is, it, so we haven't been there yet. We're coming um, later on in the year, but um, just from the amount of people that were enjoying it and liking it and talking to us, we decided, <laughs> well, let's continue the exhibition. So at the end of twelve months, there'll be a new exhibition in exactly the same spot that's even bigger and better, <gasps> and 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 kind of scarier for us because. It's um, the size of it, but we love challenges. And so that will be replacing it, um, yeah, in in 12 months' time. Yes. And Gillian, Mark, these pieces then kind of go on world tour, am I correct? So you're bringing something else in to replace what's at World Trade right now. Where will that exhibit go? To London, right? To London. London, Yeah. To London. So we, we, um, as you know, Lisa and I'm from London, so... um, we, we love exhibiting in London, but we really love exhibiting in New York as well because actually we lived in New York for four and a half years. So it was a home for us for a long time and we do come back regularly, regularly to visit as well. So it's, it's between London and New York that we love doing these exhibitions. And when the pieces go on tour, do they stop at multiple countries before they come back to you or once they leave you, do they not come back? Sometimes they go to permanent locations and they stop the tour. So if sometimes if somebody really, really loves it, like we ended up giving um, King Nyani, was it to Brooklyn? Chicago, was it? Chicago Zoo. Brookfield Zoo. Zoo. Brookfield Zoo. Brookfield Zoo. Oh, yes. really? It's there yes. permanently? Yes. So that's great to know. Yes. 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 So some, oh, that's so great to know. People was like, I wondered where that went next because I felt not enough people yeah. saw it because at that time the city was very quiet. Yeah. A lot yes. of people had left. They go to the other homes, wherever, yes. wherever, and there was no line to see it anytime you went there. And normally there's a line. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So Brookfield Zoo have a, um, a really really cool breeding program, and so they wanted to acquire it again to keep supporting um, gorillas. So we thought that was a that was a great home for it. Yeah, they do amazing work over there, Lisa Ann. So we, we, we wanted to support them. And I, I think it's a great spot for him to live for a while. Yeah. So from- how long did it take you two to create him? Oh, two years. So most, yeah, most sculptures are about two. It, it sounds like a long time, but the process is like really, really lengthy. So most sculptures are two years, um, just in terms of the, the casting and the, the modeling and the handling of it. Um, the, each sculpture is probably about... Uh, 200 pieces that are all welded t- together so wow. you just see this one big cast yeah. but it's not the process is just really really lengthy and time consuming so yeah a good a good two years that's fascinating because if they're in pieces you have to make sure that when they line up you yes. can't see that they're in pieces i would never yes. know that they were in pieces yes. it's all in pieces it 
especially when they're very big. If, it, if something's small, it's not generally in as many pieces, but if something's very big, it does come in a lot of different pieces. Then it all gets welded together and then all the welds get covered and then we put what's called a, like a patina over it or some sort of color over it so to hide all of those welds so you can't see them. Yes, sir. let's explain to you what it is the easiest way to understand is that it's a jigsaw puzzle. So it's, it's basically taking all the little pieces together and you need them um, so small because you want to contain all the detail on it. So if we make the giant gorilla and then we do molds of every single section, they're all like jigsaw pieces. You put them all together in, in welds and then you seal the weld so you can't tell where it's joined. And then inside, that is fascinating. Well, inside then it's like a building inside. There's all steel structure because the, the, the gorilla is hollow, it's not solid. And so there's sure. steel supporting it all together. Otherwise it would just be number one, horrendously expensive. It was um, all solid and just way too heavy. I have to ask, what was the very first piece you shipped out of Australia? Do you remember? God, what was it? It had to be a rabbit woman dog man, right? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I um, think one of the first ones in New York was, the Rockefeller. was yeah. the Rockefeller. That was one of the first ones that we shipped there. One, I think it's one Rockefeller building. There's a walkthrough. Yes. And there's four. 75. 75. 75 Rockefeller, that's it. There's a walkthrough yeah. and the four paparazzi dogs are in that building. Yes. And they, it's they beautiful. Were the, yeah, they were, they were the first, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And going back to that time in your mind that they were the first, how complicated did it seem that first time shipping and, and, and making Actually, sure sorry, that they were going to be cared for? Great. There were the four dogs. They went to Dubbo. Oh, no, they Dumbo. went to Dumbo, 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 Dumbo first. Yes. Dumbo. They were on display in Dumbo first. Yes. And it was so funny because when they reached out yeah. to us and invited us, um, it sounds silly, but we didn't know what Dumbo was. We thought it was an elephant from Disney World Disney. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice area. Well, I mean, it is it is fairly new. It is fairly new. When you hear people say Dumbo, they don't say Dumbo Brooklyn. But yes. we know it's Dumbo, right? But like in New York, you would say Lower East Side or Upper East Side, yes. you know, so that's their Dumbo. Yes, right. So you got that. Yes. And then and then Julie and I are going, huh. Uh, Dumbo, that sounds kind of interesting. And then they're saying, well, there's, a, there's a great picture of the, there's a great um, uh, shot of the, the Brooklyn Bridge right behind it. And we go, oh, that's really good. And they said that the paparazzi dogs will be right in front of Brooklyn Bridge and you can take a underneath, photograph. Underneath, underneath the bridge, and, underneath the bridge. You know, you know the location where there's yes, all the movies yes. there. Where, where, where the beautiful. market is, they have that lovely market. And yep, yep. Then when you when you turn around, you just see the amazing bridge. That's where the dogs got, got put. But it's a funny story because um, we learnt a lot. So um, because we were in Australia, we were trying to organise the installation of it. And we probably went to the most expensive installers in the entire world and <laughs> just to get it in there. And there was like 100 people trying to install this. And we were just sitting there going, we're poor, we're poorer, we're completely <laughs> broke, we have no money left. <laughs> Right. So, in the beginning, uh, the smaller sculptures were so, we call those ones small now, because now we make much bigger things, and n now we're stressed about that. But in that, at that time, we thought that was huge. You know, we thought that that was, of course, you know, the biggest thing we've ever done, and it was like really scary. We were yeah, right. you didn't think you'd be putting a gorilla the size of 10 cars uh, no. all in New York City at Hudson no. Yards. And that no. had perfect placement no. as well. Yeah. And you also make it possible for people to be involved by having their own individual beautiful rabbit woman and yes. dog band. So I, you sent this to Aww. me and I cannot thank you enough. I thought you shipped this heavy thing. When you come to New York, you have to let me take you two to dinner. Oh, oh, that's deal. So lovely. Thank you. Deal. Where, where are you taking us? We're locking in now. Wherever you want. <laughs> you can start to look at menus now. Oh, you can okay. tell me whatever it is. I will have the reservation. I love the work that you two do. And an inspiring couple, your message is not just, you know, talking about your beautiful art and your work, but also educating all of us on animals, how we can protect animals that are becoming distinct, extinct, but also how you two met and were so meant to be together and didn't allow anything that was different to distract you and how perfect the two of you were. It's fascinating. 
Oh, that's well, thank, lovely. Thank you that's so, so nice. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Lisa Ann. That's yeah. lovely. <clears throat> I cannot wait to meet you both in person. It was lovely having this conversation. You'll be getting new photos next week when I'm down at World yay! Trade. Yeah, yay. And uh, I've always got my eye on the prize. I can sense your work now from a mile away. And I tell my <laughs> friends, got to go take a photo over here. Send it to Jillian Mark right away. I love it all. So Congratulations so on your success and raising awareness to help animals. And it's just beautiful. Thank you so oh, much, so. Lisa. And lovely to talk to you too. Yeah, amazing. Like really, really amazing. Yeah. Look forward to meeting you in person. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. A beautiful conversation. And they went so far out of their way because they're in Sydney, Australia. So they get up super early in the morning to make this possible for us, for me, for my podcast. Meeting Jillian and Mark was an honor today. I love watching all of their content, how they create, and the mission behind them. When we were finished recording, so when I'm done recording with someone, the platform that I use, Zencaster, you sometimes have to wait a minute or two for the files to download. And you want to make sure, Kay taught me immediately when I started using the platform, do not disconnect a call until the files download. So I always tell everyone, give it a minute till the files download. And we end up having this lovely conversation about the fact that they're coming to New York. They're going to be here at the end of the year. I also found out that Mark loves the NBA. So what was the first thing I did was I said, well, then looks like I'm taking you to a Knicks game. Looks like we are going to a Knicks game. And how are we going to get our tickets? Of course, we're going to go through Ticket Rev. Just like you would go through Ticket Rev if you want to go to a Knicks game, a concert, a show, download the app and see what is available near you. It's a very unique way to buy tickets. And there's also a feature to sell tickets. But if you want to buy tickets, it's so much easier to narrow down your section. Do you like to be center court? Do you like to be behind the basketball? Where do you like to be? Because once you narrow that down, you can pinpoint that area and a price range that you're comfortable with. And if Ticket Rev finds seats available in that area that you desire, in the price range that you require, and they will get those tickets for you. You can follow on social media at Ticket Rev, but I will be taking, I, I couldn't believe it. I loved it. So many people I've met in Australia love the NBA, wear jerseys, love it, watch the games. So I'm going to take them to a lovely dinner to thank them for all the work that they've done, all the joy that they've brought. This, these, this type of work brings joy. You walk by it and you smile. You feel it. You stop. You breathe and think of how exceptional something is. And the fact that I've been able to connect with someone around the globe by the gifts that they've given to us by sharing their passion, their art, and their love is so special. So make sure you give them a follow at Jillian Mark. And fan tracks is where the leagues need to be. Moved my home leagues over, started my new league, and I will be drafting. I will be streaming a lot of my drafts. My fan tracks league that I named Lisa Ann's Best Ball Buddies. That's people that were in the summer of best ball with me. So they had to be in those drafts to be able to be chosen to be in this league. I will be live on air with Howard Bender during that draft. So we'll be streaming it on my show, which is going to be super cool, drafting the night before the very first NFL game. So you will. this will be so interactive this season. I can't wait. If you want to move your league over, see what Fantrax has to offer, sign up today. Now, mind you, if you sign up using my promo code, which is Fantrax.com forward slash Lisa Ann, you will be automatically put in the running for the potential to win a signed CD Lamb jersey. The kind folks at Fantrax have given me a signed CD Lamb jersey to give away. Now, if you already signed up during the summer of best ball and you use my promo code, you are in. All you need to do is sign up Fantrax.com forward slash Lisa Ann, and I will be showing off that jersey this week, making sure everybody knows it is in my hands and I cannot wait to pick a winner. So follow at Fantrax and sign up Fantrax.com forward slash Lisa Ann. I feel so good about this conversation I got today. Let's kick it over and have some fun in the mailbag. The moment you've all been waiting for, the mailbag. If you want to be a part of the mailbag, you can email me at asklisaann at gmail.com. Now look. We got one here that I'm reading because I think it's a live one. And I like to sometimes use a mailbag question as a reminder of things that I don't do. This one says, hello, 
do you have Google chat? So the reminder I'm giving out is I don't DM, I don't private message. And it's nothing against anybody that wants to be on the other side of receiving those messages. It's about the fact of time management. And so I like to appeal. I always say I'm an entertainer of the masses, not the individual. I really don't know what I would say to a stranger in Google chat. I save all of that for my texting with my friends, my FaceTime with my friends. So I don't private message. So I noticed this morning when I posted something on Instagram, immediately a fake Lisa Ann account was commenting to everyone. I had to go through and delete all those comments, block that person. That's how quickly it happens. And it said like Lisa Ann private account. And that person was hoping that people would think I was going to be talking privately. So I thought this would be a good email question. As a reminder, all of my social media is the same at The Real Lisa Ann, my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann, where I air this podcast every Friday night as a live premiere. If you are listening right now, you can also go back and watch any episodes you may have missed on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. So the podcast drops for listening platform on Wednesdays and for viewing on Friday nights at 8 p.m. So just wanted to put this email in here as a reminder. No, I do not Google chat. Next question. What are you reading right now, Lisa Ann? This is a great one. So I had to come over and get this. This book keeps coming up on my feed, and I was like, obviously, it means I have to read it. Uh, It just arrived today. I'm going to start it tonight. I found that when I just do two chapters a night before I go to bed, I can steadily get through a book a week. Um, And sometimes I'll do a chapter in the morning as well. But like, if it's a really good book, sometimes you're going to keep going, but you just put it by the nightstand and you just tell yourself it's a simple, small goal, but I've found it's a great way to get through books without being like stressed over it, like committed. Even if you just read a chapter a night, you're still reading a little bit every night, but this book is The Psychology of Money. There's over 2 million copies sold. It keeps lying up on my feed, timeless lessons on wealth, greed, and happiness. So book report is due. I will make sure, but I love when people ask me what I'm reading. I was doing a book club for a minute. Things got busy. Summer happened. I started traveling. I must get back to that. Maybe that's a good thing to do during the football season. For those of you who out there who are going to get really sick of hearing me talk about fantasy football. Okay. So we have one right here. I'm not sure how I feel about this one, but hello, miss. You seem like such a sweet person. This is random, but I feel like we could really be good friends and we would get along great. I've seen your podcast and see that you're actually really sweet. This is a total shot in the dark, but if you're ever in Connecticut, you should contact me. I'll send you a pic if you want. We could FaceTime or whatever. Anyway, friends are always good to have, and you should have one to tell that you are really beautiful and precious. Hope to hear from you, John. John, I appreciate that. Uh, But... um, Something I've been trying to raise awareness about is parasocial relationships. Because I think we're getting into this space, you know, with influencers, um, something that celebrities dealt with for years that most people couldn't relate to. And now that the influencer realm has opened up the space of millions of, of people using social media to connect, I can see and sense that there's a lot more confusion than ever. And also we're in a place post pandemic where people are lonelier than they ever have been. If you went back 15 years, nobody would say, I'm going to write a letter and mail it to a stranger and hope that they write back to me. That would seem strange, right? We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't look up somebody's address that we've never met and send them a letter saying, I want to meet you. If you're in Connecticut, let's get together. Parasocial relationships are built by the one side of someone that is the viewer that continuously watches and gets to know the personality that is shared on social media, television, what have you. And the way these parasocial relationships get confusing is because there's no limit to how many hours somebody could be consuming of that person that they like. And so eventually your own brain can start to play tricks with you and you can romanticize a relationship with somebody that is officially a stranger. Now on the other side of the parasocial relationship, There's the me, there's the me, there's the influencers, there's the celebrities. And it becomes a very heavy and toxic weight for the one person to carry the weight of the million people that are having that parasocial relationship. And we're seeing more 
and more, you know, young people passing away. We're seeing, you know, whether it's an overdose or whether it's a suicide, whatever the casualty that is tragic is coming from this pressure that is created by others that are leaning into this parasocial relationship, whether it's stalking, whether whatever it may be, it, it is very heavy. So for me to explain this for a purpose is to share with everyone to be mindful of their parasocial relationships. Because just because you like someone doesn't mean that they have the available bandwidth to engage on a one-on-one -on -one with you. So that would mean I would have to engage on a one-on-one -on -one with millions of people. And that's why I brought up the first email before the book was about chatting on Google, private messages. This is very much the same. And I, I ignore a lot of these emails, but I thought I'd put this in here because I'm trying to weave the conversation of parasocial interactions into almost every podcast I do for the next six months to a year. I want to get this out there. I want to raise awareness and use some simple analogies. The analogy I just used was 15 years ago, you wouldn't have gotten someone's address that you didn't ever met, but that you liked and wrote them a letter. That would have come off as like, whoa, why, how could you get my address now? Because of email and the internet, we've become more accessible. Because of social media and the fact that you can tag somebody, we've become more accessible. That doesn't mean it's healthy for the people on the other side to foist their emotions onto the actual creator. And it does become heavy. It does become toxic. And I have seen it start to wear on very successful influencers, celebrities, and people because you end up getting overwhelmed with thousands of these requests a day. So John, thank you so much for acknowledging that you think I'm sweet. As you can only imagine, as busy as I am with all that I have going on, the free time that I do have is carved out exclusively for the friendships that I've already built, the people that I know, and the people that know me on a human level and not on the parasocial level. People that don't know me, like I don't talk to most of my friends on social media at all. Um, we don't even DM, we just text, you know, that that's a different space. They understand what that space is for me. It's a very heavy, busy space. But so we all have to reel it in and remember that just because we send, just because we like someone doesn't mean we should approach them and ask them for more. Because what I'm offering is what I'm offering. I'm offering all of my content, all of my social media, all of my podcasts, my two books that I've written, The Life and the Life Back. I am offering information, entertainment, a bit of my personality, but I'm never going to offer myself. So thank you very much for that email, but I thought it was important to say that. All right, two more here. This one's from Sheila, and I loved it. Dear Lisa, if you were starring in a court cartoon, what character would you play? I am going to keep it incredibly simple, Sheila, and to everybody out here. I'm going to be Snoopy because Snoopy is still my favorite. When it's time to search for a gift to respond to somebody about something on social media, I will do my best to find a Snoopy one. I learned how to draw Snoopy very young. I had Snoopy everything. Snoopy is just a happy, easygoing dog. He's friends, little bird. Uh, Snoopy is everything. So I am going to choose to play. I thought about Mrs. Smurf because when I was young, I had all the Smurfs. Then I realized, no, Snoopy just does it for me. Snoopy is neutral. Everybody loves Snoopy. And Snoopy doesn't have a lot of responsibility, just has to be adorable. One more here from Matt. Matt says, your YouTube videos are good and informative. Also, I am not much into football, more into hockey but your nice personality shines through. You rock, Lisa. Matt, I wanted to just read that because it is so good to write a positive email. One of the greatest business books I read said every successful person says a thank you note every day, a handwritten thank you note. So now that we're not really into the handwriting as much, Matt took the approach of writing me a email thank you note thanking me for my content and just being super cool. And it's great to just read an email sometimes and go, you know, it's not really a mailbag question, but man, it's a great mailbag feeling. So I wanted to leave this on a high frequency, on a high vibe, because I'm sitting here next to rabbit woman and dog man. I'm holding them up fearlessly right now. You can't see, but when you watch on Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, you will be. 
you're going to go and follow Julie and Mark on all their social media. I will make sure that you have everything easy for you to tag. Find their beautiful pieces when you travel. Take photos and tag them. Learn about the animals that are uh, fighting extinction and all the incredible work that they do. I was thrilled to set up this conversation. Check out at Ticket Rev, download the app. You know all about fantracks.com forward slash Lisa Ann if you want to be in the running for an autographed CD Lamb jersey. Both of my books are still available on my store, personally autographed. Just go to shoplisaann.com. Both of my books are also available on audiobook, easy to find as well. You can go to Amazon. You can go to, to, to Spotify, now everywhere. So they are narrated in my voice as well. This weekend, I will be in Canton. I will be making sure that I am bringing you with me through the means of my social media. Fantasy Football Fridays will be back on Friday, September 1st. I'll be visiting St. Louis, TMASTL. I'll be visiting the Word with G, ESPN Chattanooga. I'll be visiting um, Sports Radio 610 in Houston with Payne and Pendergast. I'll be visiting um, Jay and Zach on WDAE in Tampa. It's going to be a ton of fun. So this weekend, Canton, Saturday, August 26th, I will be at the Sapphire Pool for the ultimate fantasy football draft weekend. Thank you all again for listening. If you're a new listener, subscribe, like, and review. That helps podcasts so much. Check out my YouTube channel. Subscribe there as well, where you'll be able to see every episode you have not yet seen. I thank you all so much for making this just so inspiring to meet people, to share conversations with all of you. And thank you for listening to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. Thank you.